Welcome to Feedback Strategies for your online course. If you're just joining us, we haven't actually started yet, so it's a great time to hop into the session. We do have a couple of goals for this session today. Uh, we're going to start with some introductions so I can get to know all of you. Uh, we're going to identify a couple of types of feedback. We're going to form some plans for how we can communicate with our students. Uh, we're going to discuss some strategies and best practices. And I have mixed in there some specific tips about Blackboard because I know we get a lot of questions about that. Um, and of course, we're going to explore those tools. So I have some screenshots, but um, if you have any specific questions, feel free to um, interrupt or, you know, we can always exchange emails after the workshop. And of course, we do have the formal Q&A at the end, but it's a small group, so please feel free to ask questions along the way. Okay, so hopefully you were able to find the text chat and if you want to go ahead and type in the chat I'd just love to know your name uh, what is it that you're teaching or what's your role and describe the most memorable piece of feedback you received as a student and maybe why it stands out so I'm going to pause and I'll let you type away Great, I see a couple of responses coming in. Welcome, Natalie. Uh, Natalie teaches in special and early ed and not sure what is one great piece of advice, so that'll take you a while. You know, could have been good, could have been bad, um, but great. Um, I think it's nice to just reflect for a moment from the student perspective, so it helps us to generate some of that effective feedback. Welcome, Suzanne. All right, I'm just reading your feedback right now. Most memorable feedback. I was encouraged to take more ownership of what I was conveying in a paper and not afraid to use your voice. Um, it stood out because it gave you more confidence. Excellent. Welcome, JC. Your most memorable feedback, you are enough, but there is more from your intro to design professor. It stood out because it helped you build confidence. Excellent. Okay. I love that all of you took this from a positive place. Uh, sometimes we only have memories of bad feedback. So um, I'm glad that you have all these positive memories. And I think it'll inspire us to do the same thing for our own students. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and we can hop into the different types of feedback because there are a couple of different types. So we do have the three different types of feedback and I, I think it's important just to bring this up and to put it out on the table right away because oftentimes as instructors, we are so concerned about the feedback that we have to supply that sometimes we overlook um, the importance of some of the other ones. Um, so there is the feedback that you give your students. Um, that's obviously the, the first one there. Um, and that tends to be the one that we think of immediately when we think of feedback. 
But we also have student feedback, um, and that's where we kind of reciprocate with the students when we ask them to tell us things, um, areas where we could improve, um, things that went well for them, um, and that helps us learn where we can improve our own pedagogy and our own curriculum. And we should never forget about the peer feedback. Um, and I know that there are some mixed reactions to peer feedback. Some people are worried that it can generate misinformation, um, but there are ways that you can use peer feedback um, kind of in a controlled manner and it'll help students learn from each other. So we will take a little bit of a look at that today too. So we also have to plan for this communication, right? We know there's three different forms, um, but how do we plan for it? And I thought I would just introduce quickly a, a slide for you. So I, I know it's supposed to be a comic and it's supposed to be kind of funny, um, but sometimes there is this um, problem with communication. <laughs> Natalie, I'm glad you enjoyed the comic. Um, you know, we want our students to be responsive and to you know immediately grasp a hold of our feedback um, but sometimes then we're like as feed as professors we think that we should operate on a different timeline um, and i think sometimes that can be confusing for students so we're going to take a look at maybe a couple of different ways um, that we can both benefit from a from having some sort of a timeline in place So this is an example that you see up on the screen of a syllabus statement that I happen to, to like. Um, I found that this helps students a lot. Um, there are some areas in here for, with specific information. Um, I typically do not respond to emails after 5 p.m. Um, so that gives you some leeway as an instructor to walk away from your email. Um, it, it helps so that you can kind of create that work-life balance for yourself. Um, please allow 24 hours for me to respond. I cannot guarantee a response on the weekends. Um, those are all things that will help your students. Uh, the other one that I like is down below, and I, I've actually seen variations of this in several different faculty members' emails. So I understand that your schedule may be different than mine, this was always very important to me as a student. I, I had never thought about it once before as a student, but um, I was logging in late at night to do my homework. I, I worked a night shift. So when I got off of work at midnight, I, I would go home. I was still wide awake and I would do my homework. And my instructor actually commented on it and said, oh, you should never be working this late on your work. Um, but as my schedule permitted, that was actually um, the most effective time for me. So I, I do like to kind of put some of these statements periodically either in my syllabus or in a tagline, an email, just to let my students know that we might be on different, different schedules. I've seen, I reserve the weekend for faith, family, and friends. Sure, something to that effect. I think you can feel comfortable um, just saying you're not available. If you wanna put something like what you're doing on the weekend, you can do that too. Um, it's really about your own personal comfort level, but it's nice just to tell your students one way or the other, if you're not available on the weekend, at least then they know, um, then they aren't staring at their, their email waiting for a reply. Yes, self-care is crucial for everybody. Again, some of these things I know are, are best practices and they are, they're familiar to you, um, but there's different ways that you can think about how you wanna incorporate your message. So all assignments, unless otherwise noted, are due on Sunday by 11.59 p.m. Um, grades will be updated or posted within three business days. That's a nice way just for students to get into a routine. Otherwise, as you can see on the picture there, I want it now. Uh, that's when people start knocking on your door <laughs> and emailing you. So we're just trying to cut down on some of those unnecessary messages. And of course, the other one that I like to do is this is going back to um, when we talked about asking your, your students for their feedback. Um, solicit feedback, ask them through surveys, 
Qualtrics is a really good tool for this. Um, so it can be anonymous, but you can ask your students, um, you know, what are their thoughts on an activity? You know, how prepared did they feel for a large assessment? Um, so encouraging them to give you feedback, I, I think also opens those channels of communication. They're gonna feel valued as well. All right, so we have building in the peer review activities. And I promise I, I do have some specific information about how you can do this uh, within the learning management system within Blackboard. So we'll get to that too. Um, but I, I'm just curious, how do you all of you feel about peer review? There's no right, there's no wrong um, answer on this, but on average, how often do you ask students to critique their peers work? Maybe never, um, maybe often. Um, advantages, disadvantages. Okay. In writing projects can be useful in some of the graduate level courses. A couple of times, very little. I always ask this because I know so many people have different opinions on it. Um, any advantages or disadvantages that stand out to you? Okay, graduate versus undergraduate matters. Sure, maybe they're experience level and communication, absolutely. I will say as an instructor, sometimes it is nice to take a break from being the sole person giving them feedback. It, it can be nice when they hear it from other people. JC, I love this. You have your students uh, do some sort of a presentation, and then when they give feedback, um, they have to give something maybe that stood out, something that they did well, or then maybe something to improve. Yes, that's a very balanced approach. Group supervision and counseling groups, excellent. So there are these opportunities. And I think it's important for us as instructors also to take a little bit of a, a breather, like we talked about before, some of that self-care. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at a couple of different strategies here. The call for self-reflection. Now I have heard that this is particularly difficult sometimes if you're dealing with maybe incoming freshmen, students who haven't had much experience at the college level. Um, so there are some things here that, that you can do to help with that self-reflection. Only use those open-ended questions, nothing that they can infer as a yes or no question. Um, it's a great idea to put some type of a rubric with the um, self-reflection. How long should it be? You know, how many sentences or how many pages, depending on the type of um, self-reflection that you've assigned and also asking them to self-grade. So self-grade is really taking it even one step further than saying, how did you do? Um, now they actually have to put a, a grade next to it and justify it. Um, so this can oftentimes lead to more insightful commentary. Otherwise, um, students might just want to say, well, I think I did a overall a really good job. Um, so asking them to to look at maybe a rubric and to decide where they fall on a specific uh, grading scale can can be very insightful about their their own knowledge um, and their own kind of evaluation practices. Another thing here that we have is this idea of exit slips. Um, I always call them exit slips, but I, I've called them different things in the past as well. Um, so you can use this really for any type of a class period. If you're teaching online and you have no synchronous sessions, you could just insert it at the end of maybe a weekly unit or model. Um, 
pardon, or module. Um, so this is where students can give you some feedback before moving on to the next stage. And typically you can ask them, you know, several different things, um, either, you know, what was confusing, um, just start with the things that, what do you need to know more about? Um, where are you least confident? Um, you can also ask them something, what did you learn? What was your takeaway from, from this particular section? And you can also optionally leave a third section open and you can just say, what else do you want me to know? I typically don't grade these. However, some faculty will also use it as attendance. And so um, in that sense, it might be worth a couple of points um, just to ensure that somebody actually attended class and participated. Um, but past that, I, I wouldn't use these slips really for a substantial amount of points towards their grade. It's optional if you want to make these um, anonymous. So if you feel like your students aren't um, being brave and, and telling you really like what they find confusing, um, you can always try it maybe without um, asking them to put their names on these types of communications. And in Blackboard, if you again wanted to do this completely virtually, you could just do um, an anonymous grading activity. Excellent. I love when, when we hear success stories. So someone um, uses it for attendance each week and she had great success with it. Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways that you can incorporate it. But again, it's always that asking students for a little bit more information. Um, tell me what you learned. Tell me what's difficult. Um, what do you have questions about? Um, and optionally, that third one right there, what else do you want me to know? Sometimes students will tell you um, other activities that they think might be more beneficial. And I've heard a lot of instructors uh, say that was really eye-opening and they, they were eager to try um, a new activity. So try one of these if you've never tried it, possible. You can also do something like utilizing the peer review system. And so I, I did promise earlier that I was going to incorporate some examples with uh, Blackboard Ultra in our LMS, um, because I think this is also an important part, not just uh, the pedagogy, but actually the technical application and how we can utilize this peer review system. So um, this is actually an example um, that you see up here on the screen of a peer review setting. Anytime you want to change your settings on an assignment in Blackboard, just look for that little gear icon. It's usually up in the top right corner. And so this is where I selected the peer review settings. It is anonymous from the student perspective, but I do want to highlight that as an instructor in the gradebook, you can see everybody's name. So you can see who wrote the original submission and you can also see um, which students supplied feedback. So you can assure students um, if, if you're worried about them getting off track or maybe not being polite or professional that you will be monitoring everything. So. You can tell your students that um, when they do their original submission, that they don't have to put their name on it. Um, so then students don't know, you know, whose work they're reading. So that's a possibility. It's going to call for two different due dates when you do the peer review assignment. So the first date is when the first actual assessment is due, the original submission. And then the peer review date is when they have to have completed the um, assigned peer reviews. In order to review your peers' work, you have to make sure you turn in your original submission. So that is something that I, I wanted to point out about Blackboard. And it's up to the instructor on how many reviews you can do. So, um, you know, do you want two reviews per student, three, four? Um, this oftentimes depends on the class size, uh, but you control that. And then it's just automatically generated. So, um, you know, it takes that that pressure off of you for redistributing all these uh, different submissions. Had anybody ever seen the peer review in Blackboard Ultra? No? Okay. Excellent. Well, let's take a look at a couple of these um, best practices. So this is per 
my director, she loves to call it the feedback sandwich. So of course I had to um, incorporate a couple of sandwiches in here. So I hope you're enjoying the graphics. The feedback sandwich is this idea that there's three different parts to it really. So there's the evidence, um, and this is where you specifically um, refer to your expectations. And this should have been probably something you either illustrated in specific detail in the assignment prompt or followed up with, uh, with a rubric. And then their work. So again, you're gonna want to talk about what you were expecting and what you found and, and talk about those specific areas that you looked at. That kind of center section of the sandwich is where you talk about something positive, what they do well. Um, sometimes we're so focused on areas of improvement that we forget to tell students that they did something wonderful and we wanna see more of it. And so this is really that part about being balanced. And the bottom part there is measurable. So again, this is going back to suggesting something um, that they can, that they could change, that they could improve um, and giving them something quantifiable. So. I've seen a lot of instructions where they'll say, I want you to clearly discuss, you know, two different concepts. Um, that can be a very, very difficult for a student to measure. They, what is clear to them and what is clear to you might be um, on two different wavelengths. So again, I would refer back to this idea of maybe either using a rubric or just using a very detailed assignment prompt, um, but giving some specific examples so that they know whether or not they've met your your expectations. All right, so now we have the federal uh, policy about regular and substantive interaction. So I do have a couple of questions coming up for you here. Um, but regular and substantive interaction also ties into feedback because this is a requirement of online courses and it really has three main components and that's going to be the fact that it's initiated by the instructor, it's frequent and consistent, and it's focused on the course subject. And I know I put on here the website for this at NIU, but I will follow up with an, with an email to this workshop. So if you're scrambling to look up this website, don't worry, I promise I'll send it to you. So I thought I would throw out a couple of different scenarios and I'm gonna let you vote on them in the, in the chat. So the first one is each week or unit of your course includes a required discussion forum. You supply feedback and commentary, but you do not reply to every student post. This is an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction policy, true or false. I see one vote. Natalie, are you on the fence? Are you undecided? Okay. Suzanne is not sure either. It's frustrating, isn't it? We know that this is a federal policy, but then when we actually go to apply it, we, you have to really question it the substantive piece, yes. Okay. I put this one in here because I, I think that there, it does have to be both, yes. I put this one in here because I think a lot of instructors feel that in order to meet this policy that they have to respond to every single peer um, submission in the discussion board. And realistically, we have some very large class enrollments and I don't know if you could respond to 100 students every single week in a discussion board. So this is actually an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction policy. Um, you are providing feedback to your students. You have a discussion board in here. Another clue was that each week that you have a, a discussion board. So presumably um, if you respond to 10 students in, one week, you might respond to 10 other students in another week. Um, so it is ongoing and it is substantive because you are furthering the discussion in the discussion board um, without monopolizing it. 
Tricky though, right? Okay, we'll try another one. So number two, you host open office hours virtually every week. Students can drop in with questions or concerns. This is an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction policy, true or false. Yes, I'll return to the previous slide. What do we think? True or false for number two? I see one vote. This one is false. So it is initiated by the instructor, but if we go back to that previous slide, it is not frequent and consistent. Students might drop in, they might never come in. So a way that you could turn this around to make this a regular and substantive interaction policy is you host virtual office hours every week and you request that your students come in to see you. Um, it, it is actually a requirement for them to come in. Students never attend yours? Ah, yes. Um, so I have often set it up where I might have virtual office hours and I might meet with my students a couple of times during the semester. I might ask them to come in early on just so that we can talk and then they can feel comfortable hearing my voice or seeing my face. And then I might ask them to come in later on in the semester, and this could be more than once, but um, usually I'll have a, an agenda for that meeting. So I'll ask them to come in maybe with a draft of their work. Correct, Natalie. So even though you frequently and consistently offer it, it does not meet the requirement. Um, it is, you frequently offer it. Um, however, it's not consistent because uh, students don't consistently show up. So the interaction here again is this, um, this kind of the requirement where we know we're actually going to interact. If nobody ever shows up, then no interaction has taken place. Correct. All right, third one. Students are asked to read several articles and they are assigned passages of the textbook. You supply a list of questions that students should keep in mind while synthesizing the required reading material. This is an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction, true or false? Yes, Natalie, go ahead. I am so sorry. I'm honestly trying to understand not more so be difficult. So I hope it's not coming off as I'm being difficult. Um, I, okay, so the first question, though, say I'm a student and I never got any commentary back from you because I, you know, it just so happened to be that way because I do have a class of 100 and plus students. So you didn't interact with me, but that would still be considered regular and substantive. substantive? Yes. Um, now, if you didn't interact with every single student, it's possible maybe you didn't reply specifically to their first submission. Um, but as 
an instructor discussion board is this idea that it's back and forth conversation. And so in that way, you are clarifying maybe areas where you notice some information being misgenerated or maybe people were veering off track and you, and you brought the, the conversation you know, back to the topic at hand. Um, so in this way, you are still having regular and substantive interaction with your students um, because you are there um, helping move the discussion along. And odds mm -hmm. are you probably at some point are going to have interacted with those students in a discussion board um, just for the simple fact that either they initially put in the very first um, original submission or they may have um, been involved in the thread where they they responded to appear okay so with that first one is more so the whole class can see your discussion yes so because everybody can see it it counts yes. okay okay thank you I think there is a lot of, I think faculty were, were very stressed that they, they felt this obligation to respond to every single one of those discussion posts. Um, and that's really an unrealistic workload. And the other part is uh, when we have class discussions, we really want the students to engage with one another. And as faculty, we don't wanna dominate that conversation either. We wanna be there and be present um, but they are the ones who should be submitting the most content in a in a discussion board. Great, wonderful. I'm glad you asked that. That's a, a really good question. All right, are we feeling good about uh, number three? I, I saw one reply. Anyone else care to weigh in? Okay, I see some different answers in here. So this one is really tough. At the start of this workshop, we talked about three different forms of interaction. There's feedback from the instructor, there's feedback from the student to the instructor, and then there is feedback between students. So this one, if we're looking at it, um, students are asked to read several articles and assign passages of the textbook and you supply a list of questions. Um, is that an example of meeting the regular and substantive interaction policy? It is false. And the reason for this is the interaction is between the student and the course content, but regular and substantive interaction policy refers to interaction between individuals, between people. I'm not suggesting that you don't supply some questions for your students. I think that's a very important piece of content. Um, it just isn't an indicator of this particular policy. All right, now that I've exhausted you, I feel like brain teasers. So let's take a look at some of these other things that we can do with providing feedback and some some strategies that are going to help you balance your workload, especially since now that I've heard that some of you have large course rosters. Um, one of the ideas here is this concept of minimal marking. And this is where you try to be very targeted and specific with your marking. Um, I was actually in a course in college and you know this was pre, pre Blackboard days. I know I'm dating myself here, um, but they, they would actually um, walk into the classroom and your instructor would hand you back your paper. And I remember I looked up and he was just smiling and, and somebody asked, well, what's so funny? And he goes, oh, he's like, I, this happens every period. He's like, no matter how much time I put into my comments. And he was like, the first thing that happens is everybody flips to the black to the back page and they uh, go look at their grade. So 
he was just like, I, I've learned the art of minimal marking. Yes, provide commentary. Yes, provide feedback. Um, but don't, don't stress yourself out with how much feedback you need to put in there. Um, less can be more if it, it's really targeted and specific. So it helps you kind of avoid auto-correcting. You know, if you see a whole bunch of punctuation mistakes, you might find um, one or two sentences, highlight it and say, I've noticed that you seem to have a problem with run on sentences. This is one example. Can you find more? Something to that effect. You want to focus on future improvements. So again, the idea here is um, if you're going to tell your students that this is an area where you could explore further, um, this is some place where you might want to make some changes, um, give them an opportunity to make those changes. Students get really frustrated if um, they're told to, to try again, but then there's not actually another writing attempt. So um, look for things either where maybe you're going to offer revisions, um, second attempts, or if you're going to ask them to take this particular writing technique or whatever um, strategy it was they discussed in their, their paper um, and see how they can apply it in the next one. We want to positively encourage them that, you know, they can grow and they can learn from past mistakes. And in doing so, you're going to draw your students into the revision process. Again, um, you want to ask them some questions or to nudge them in the right direction. All right, so your timing. I do kind of love this little cartoon. I feel like this is my inbox some days. It's really a, a great idea to send out messages to your students, announcements. Um, you know, you can always mark it in Blackboard where it goes directly to their email. So there's a good chance that they're going to see the message. Um, this would also count for regular and substantive interaction, but it is possible that you could send too many messages. So you're going to want to think about frequency, urgency, timing. Um, some faculty believe in maybe sending out a reminder that something is due a couple days ahead of time so that students remember to, to work on their assignment. Um, some faculty have developed a strategy where they'll send out um, a reminder when something is due and then they'll send out another message letting students know that something has been graded. But um, if your students become immune to your emails, then you may have too many. So I would think of maybe some sort of a pattern or routine that your students can come to expect. Um, but I would probably say somewhere between one, maybe two messages is a good amount per week. Three, if there's an urgent matter. OK. Yes, the classroom newsletter, excellent. So I have some examples of feedback up here. So my. My colleague was very nice um, and offered to generate this, so it has her name on it. Um, but I'd like you to look at the, the actual yellow bubbles here from Tracy Miller. So Tracy Miller is the instructor. Um, what do you think of her feedback? Good, bad, in between? Give you a hint.
I see one vote for good. Anyone agree or disagree? Maybe not so good now that you've returned to that slide. <laughs> okay. All right. I would say that these types of questions or types of uh, responses for the feedback are somewhere in the middle. They are not the absolute worst type of feedback you could give a student, um, but there is room for improvement. JC, I agree. I'm, I'm somewhere caught in the middle. They aren't terrible, but they aren't wonderful. Um, I don't know as a student, if I read this from my instructor, I wouldn't know um, what they thought I did well. There is nothing um, about that. And, you know, as far as being measurable, I, I might still have a little bit of trouble. Um, please provide more detail. Uh, you know, I, I would like to know what do they want me to provide for those types of details. I think they're kind of on the right track, but you know, there's definitely room for improvement on that feedback. So, um, you know, and and I think if we can look at our feedback as, you know, being inspiration to spur students on to to do better on their second attempt, um, and yes, I, I would like to know how I could improve my feedback for them. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I think we're doing pretty well on time. So we have some different tools. I did promise Blackboard because we're all switching to Blackboard Ultra. Some of you may already be using it. Um, OK, so here we go. We have Blackboard Annotate for customizable feedback. One of the things that you should know about uh, Blackboard Annotate is that this works when students submit something that's an attached you know, PDF or Word document. So if they just type in the uh, chat bar or um, submission bar, I should say, for an assignment, then you might not see all of these options. But it does have some nice features here for you. So I've kind of outlined them in red. You can use a rubric, which is really nice. Um, you can just kind of go down the line and determine whether students met the criteria or did not meet the criteria for an assignment. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever received uh, from one of my colleagues is when you create a rubric, you should just try to make it worth um, one individual point um, instead of point ranges. So, you know, was your paper five pages? If it was, great, you get you know all five points. Um, if you didn't um, quite reach five pages, then that would be the next line down, um, and they could only get three out of the five possible points. I've heard that it's a, a time saver. So um, if you're working with rubrics, try to just um, avoid point ranges, and it'll save you time with grading. Then you don't have to decide, um, did they get four points or did they get five points? Um, you can provide feedback right there with the, with the rubric. Um, so I think I have some more pictures of that coming up. And then um, in the center of the uh, screen here, I, I have another red box. Um, so there are some different things here. You can actually use the content library. Um, and so this is where you can actually save things like frequently used uh, comments for your students so that you don't have to keep retyping it over and over again. Um, so I, I thought that was particularly helpful. Wonderful. OK, we'll move on to another one. So these are how the grading rubrics work right now. I don't believe um, they still work with questions. So um, grading rubrics work with things like essays, but um, if there are multiple choice questions on that ex same exam, um, then it won't allow you to attach a grading rubric. But I know those changes are coming soon. So hang tight for that. Um, but this is typically what the grading rubric looks like. Um, every time you create a new category, um, you'll You'll see that populate in the grade center, and you'll just click the little down arrow next to each um, 
each category that you've created. So that's what my red arrow is pointing at. When you do that, it'll expand a window and it'll say, did you know students exceed expectations, meet expectations, or does not meet expectations? And again, rating rubrics are fully customizable. You can make as many of those categories as you want. You can rename them. Um, but all you have to do then is just click on the number and it'll auto um, calculate the student score for you. So I think this student received 90 out of 90 points, but um, you know, if they miss some points, then it would just automatically um, correct the, the numerical value for you. And you can give feedback either at the assignment level or you could do it at the criterion level. So, you know, if something was wrong with their organization, you could just put a comment um, in just in that section. You can also do audio and video feedback. So this is another way that may save you some time. Um, if you, you don't want to go and manually type up comments for each of your students. So this is enabled in the um, Grade Center. And all you have to do is when you go to grade and assignment, um, you're gonna look for that little uh, feedback area. And you're gonna click the little plus button. And then you can just type recording. So I tested it out. Um, it's really as easy as that. If you have a webcam, um, you're good to go. So you can you can do either with your webcam on or off. Has anybody ever tried using audio or video feedback? Yep. It's it's really nice. It is. It's surprising um, how much faster it can make your your grading go. You also can do things um, at the group level and at the um, individual level. So, if you do a group assignment, um, typically what happens is everybody will get the exact same grade. Um, however, you know maybe one person went above and beyond. Um, and you want to give them a slightly higher um, score, you're going to have to do this, I believe, from the um, list view in the Ultra Gradebook, but you can change the score for an individual. So um, only that one person will see a different score. Um, and again, same thing, you can do uh, feedback for the group or feedback for the individual. So that's really handy as well. So this is just another screenshot of what it looked like. Um, as you can see, I was in a group with Leonardo da Vinci, Louisa Alcott, Sean Connery, and Winston Churchill. It's a very exciting group. Um, but I, I did a slightly better job. Um, so here, my instructor was able to give me um, 95 out of 100, whereas my group members only received 75 points. So GC, to create the groups, you can do this um, at the um, assignment level. And if you give me just a moment here, I'll even show you a quick example of what that looks like. I could demonstrate it for you. Um, but you would click the gear icon in the top right corner of the assignment, and you would scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you would assign to groups. Okay, great. Um, if you're able to hang around, I'll, I'll give a quick demonstration of what that looks like in a sandbox for all of you. Um, so automated feedback. This is, again, um, something that you can do with exams. It does not work for things like essay questions. Essay questions have to be manually graded, but automated feedback, you can um, deliver this for things like multiple choice questions. Um, and you can decide, you know, when your students are allowed to see the correct answer. Some instructors want to wait until all of the exams have been collected before that displays. Um, other instructors just say, once you take the test, that's fine. You can you can see the the feedback. So um, this is just another example of how you can provide feedback to your students in a quick and timely manner.
All right, so um, here's the peer review again. I, I know we already talked about it, so I'm gonna, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip this one. And then Q&A, um, I can go ahead and, and show you how to create groups for assignments, um, unless there are any other questions. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll, and I'll also go ahead.